hope you enjoy addressing Gettysburg's first spinoff show, That's What She Said, a show about women of the Civil War era from Gettysburg and beyond. This show first premiered on Patreon a year ago, and with the help of our patrons, we've developed it over the last 12 months. Did you know that 18 out of 21 phlebotomists agree that listening to Addressing Gettysburg's Patreon shows can help you prepare for the guide exam? If that's not convincing enough, you should hear what six out of six and a half dentists say. It'll blow your mind. So help keep addressing Gettysburg going and learn a ton from the hundreds of episodes we've produced for you over the last five years on our Patreon page. So please go to patreon.com slash addressing Gettysburg to join today. First and second lieutenants get every episode we put out each month and then some. We thank you in advance. And now on with the show. From the Gettysburg Museum of History Studios, you're listening to Addressing Gettysburg. That's what she said. (laughs) Hi, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Addressing Gettysburg's That's What She Said, the show where we discuss the lives of women of Gettysburg. Um, I am Veronica Bristensky. And I'm Bethany Yingling. And today we have a very special guest, um, Dr. Ashley Whitehead Lusky. Um, Probably most of our listeners are going to know her uh, predominantly from the Gettysburg College Civil War Institute. But Ashley wears several titles. um, Author, correct? Mm -hmm. Previous park ranger. um, Obviously, doctor. Doctor. We (laughs) We talked about that earlier. Yeah. I just like saying doctor, Doctor. Ashley. (laughs) A little bit of a sinister something to that. I don't know why, but yeah. (laughs) Yeah. No, it's... I just... I love the fact that you are a female doctor of history, (laughs) and you're younger. You totally throw all of the stereotypes of history nerdiness out of the window and that's why I love you oh well I'm, I'm glad to hear that no. continue Veronica <laughs> no, sorry no I, I, I don't want to steal your thunder at all this um, was Ashley's thunder I'm like, <laughs> fair enough Ashley what else can you tell us about yourself um, like like um, Bethany said you are extremely young <laughs> to have your you know your doctorate and everything and, and I think your bio said something to the effect of prior to even starting your education career um, you spent approximately nine ten years in the park service as well so right. you must have started like I don't know 12 years old or something like that which is pretty impressive <laughs> when I was little walk on the battlefield yeah. <laughs> yeah when I was little I wished that I could start at 12 years old I'll tell you that because I grew up in a historical house um, historic house just outside Boston Massachusetts uh, it was built in the 1770s. So I was literally, yes, toddling around, surrounded by history. Oh, um, so it started from a young age. Uh, but yeah, I always wanted to work for the Park Service. Instead of going to Disney World, my parents <laughs> took us to national parks, which, yeah, you guys are, are nodding. I yeah. know you know the, the family. <laughs> we were right there with yes. you, too. Yeah, we've talked about that before. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. I've yet to step foot in a Disneyland of any yeah. kind, <laughs> like a Disney park, and I'm 41 years old now, so whatever. But uh, <laughs> thanks, Mom and Dad. <laughs> So that's where, yeah, that's where it all started. So, yeah, I um, I went to, to college for history, um, specifically for the public history focus. Uh, I went to William & Mary, which is, of course, right across from Colonial Williamsburg. Total hands-on history effect. Mm-hmm. And while I was there, I started a seasonal position working at Historic Jamestown. So that was my first kind of official foray, foray into the Park Service. And then... When I graduated and went on to grad school, it's when I started doing seasonal work with Richmond National Battlefield Park, just outside Richmond, Virginia, and then eventually became permanent there and worked through their 150th, uh, that crazy whirlwind of four years that we all know and love so well. Um, And then from there, hopped over to West Virginia for a year. That's where my husband teaches. And then we came down here to Gettysburg and got the job at CWI. Wow, that's neat. How long have you been with CWI then? So it's coming up on six years this summer. Oh, wow. Which is hard to believe. It's been that long. (laughs) That's awesome, though. (laughs) That is really neat. And it, it has like this caliber. As somebody who has done events for you know other sure. organizations the CWI has like it's like the place to be yeah. like it's <laughs> the place you want to be prestigious. yeah, 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 yeah. Particu- <laughs> particularly <laughs> prestigious yeah, yeah. <laughs> I am not so obviously I <laughs> well that's very kind but it's a it's a place that strives to we obviously do a lot of work with the students at the college I work with them doing 
uh, independent and small group research projects, in, uh, interpretive workshops out in the battlefield, that kind of thing. But we also do this big conference every June, plug, June 9th to 14th <laughs> this year, um, which is for the general public. So we try to be accessible. We try to recruit people who range from maybe they've heard the name Gettysburg before and are interested in learning more to people who have been reading seriously on the Civil War for years and years and they want to come and hear lectures and go on battlefield tours. So it really is a place that strives to blend the academic with the public history and appeal to the the general public in a way that um, you know is a little different than than most places of uh, higher learning sure and it really attracts a lot of big name stars yeah. in, in our field right yeah, in our industry definitely. right sure. that sounds like the nerdiest thing you're probably going to hear in the show today but really I mean they're like the the stars of the history world um, yeah their so. names everybody I mean if you've studied this at all their names people know sure and sure. I I'm always very jealous <laughs> you guys always have a standing invitation to attend the lectures so. i know it's always on the same day as something work, like sure. yeah 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 i'm just gonna have to quit my job for a week <laughs> go to the cwi come back to work yes. beg for forgiveness we'll see what happens that's right <laughs> Real quick, Doctor, you have another project with the students um, called Killed at Gettysburg. Is that still ongoing? Or? It is. Yeah, yeah. This was something that actually started the spring before I came to Gettysburg College. It started with Dr. Peter Carmichael in a Civil War class that he was teaching at the time. Um, and then I, I kind of took it over when I came to CWI. And the, the student fellows who I work with have been the ones who've been spearheading that since. Um, and it's a project that it strives to take the story of Gettysburg and and push it down to a very individual level. It looks at the various soldiers, a cross section of the soldiers, of course we haven't done all 7,000 that were killed at Gettysburg, um, but it, it tries to look at their experiences, their, their backgrounds, where they came from, why they enlisted, their motivations, uh, the community fabric that they grew up with. Their experiences during the war, and then particularly at Gettysburg, there's an ArcGIS component, so you can actually follow technically their footsteps on the battlefield into battle where they died. Uh, or where they were mortally wounded in, in some cases. And then it, it also looks at the memory of their death, the impact of the, de the death on the family, on the community, um, looks at monumentation, how you know veterans and survivors kind of dealt with collective loss. So it really strives to make a, a very human interest story, um, a very humane story out of what could be just be you know thrown into a pile. 7,000 people killed, you know, 50,000 total casualties. Uh, we want to bring out, well, who exactly were those people? What brought them here? Why were they here? Um, and, and what happened? What were the ripple effects of, of their deaths? Well, that's a pretty impressive project. Um, yeah, I can't imagine yeah. being a student and having the opportunity to do that. Yeah, yeah. It's, um, it's impressive. By the end of the semester, they've. I feel like the length of the profiles has grown every semester. I always yeah. tell them we're going to... We don't have to write like theses here, but they become passion projects and they track down primary sources from the National Archives, from, um, you know, Gettysburg National Military Park. Some of them are calling up local historical societies or getting in contact with descendants of some of the people that they're researching. And they become just they fall in love with these stories and um, they really do become kind of tomes by the end of it. But it really changes how you view the battlefield. Sure. Um Ever since I've started working on this project, every place I go in the battlefield seems to have a soldier from Killed at Gettysburg associated with it, and it just forever changes wow, how, I, well, how yeah. I see the field. Sure. And it's a pretty nice tribute to the individual men. Right? Absolutely. So, Absolutely. Very nice project. Um, so to change gears a little bit, obviously this show, as we were explaining to you, is geared a little bit more towards like the women that were associated with um, not only Gettysburg, but the Civil War era and sure. things like that. So maybe someone, um, it, candidly, I'm, I was not very well versed in um, our subject today whatsoever. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a born and bred Yankee, right? So yeah. <laughs> I know a little bit about Mary Todd Lincoln, probably not even as much as I should know about her, but I certainly didn't know hardly anything besides uh, Jefferson Davis's wife was Verena Davis, the end of story, right? Yes. I really yeah. don't know anything about her. Yep. So I'm really fascinated to kind of dig into her life with you today during the episode. Sure. Um, so just start at the beginning. When when we sent out the feelers asking and begging <laughs> for, <laughs> for experts to come on our show to, to kind of you know share with us and the listeners like some women's stories and issues, um, you very 
kindly and graciously responded that you'd be willing to come on and you chose Verena Davis and I'm, I'm curious like what's your connection with her why her you know what's your fascination with her that kind of thing sure well um, I'm also a, a born and bred Yankee myself so <laughs> I never really knew that much about her and I think that's often the case everyone of course knows Mary Lincoln for obvious reasons um, and there are many parallels between Mary Lincoln and Verena Davis in terms of their family stories their personal and professional stories in terms of being married to you know the men who led each of the nations involved in in the civil war um but this actually this this goes back to college um when i was at william and mary we took a field trip for one of my classes and we went to the white house of the confederacy in richmond virginia and we did some background reading beforehand of course and we took a tour of the house and it wasn't one of those kind of standard admittedly somewhat boring house tours you know like the, the classic like here are three objects in the room and i'll tell you about it uh, and we'll yep. move to the next yeah. room <laughs> different it was a, a tour that was it populated the house with with living human beings and one of the stories they told was of course about verena mm-hmm. um and about the multiple roles that she played not just as the wife of jefferson davis um but as a mother and kind of a you know a social arbiter in, mm-hmm. in many ways and she just stuck out to me from then on out as someone who was immensely complex for her time. She wasn't kind of the epitome of the kind of passive Southern belle that we think of, you know, the plantation mistress who wears the big hoop skirt, um, you know, doesn't say a heck of a lot in public, very submissive kind of woman. Um, she's kind of the opposite of all of that. And because of my fascination with all of those complexities and the ways that she never really fit in, um, I, I wanted to learn more. And so that became the, the subject of my undergraduate thesis. And then it became actually kind of integrated with my, my dissertation project, um, which is currently undergoing many revisions um, <laughs> to, to put into book form. But she's kind of the kingpin around which uh, the, other, the other characters circulate. It's wow. so interesting to hear you say that she was not yeah. the standard Southern Belle because yeah. I, coming into this, assumed that she probably was, and sure. that's why we don't hear about her as much, as she was very, you know, in the background, my husband's career is first, that right. kind of thing. So to hear you say that, I'm excited. Yeah. Because I think there's going to be some drama. <laughs> Ab- yes, absolutely. Okay, this is great. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> so if you don't mind, dive on in. Tell us a little bit. Who was Verena yeah. Davis? How did she become Verena <laughs> Davis that we that we know? You know, what sure. was her background? That kind of stuff. Sure. So um, Verena was born in, uh, yeah. well, she was in... Louisiana. Her parents were visiting family at the time when she was born, but she's from Natchez, Mississippi, uh, is where they were living at the time. And um, in the ways that she's not exactly the classic Southern Belle, it's the fact that she grows up in a family that has split family ties. Um, Her grandfather had fought in the Revolutionary War and was then governor of New Jersey. Um, She herself is partially educated at a female boarding school in Philadelphia when she's younger. And then the other half of her family is um, uh, related to soldiers who fought in the War of 1812, um, you know, big plantation owner kind of family. But by the time Verena gets to marrying age, um, her family doesn't have a ton of money. They're not poor, but they don't have a ton of money and there's not a high dowry that her father can pay. Um, And so her marriage prospects aren't really that great. She also doesn't have the classic look of, you know, the Southern plantation bell, um, which for that look, it's on the thinner side, petite, uh, classic, you know, ivory colored skin. Um, Again, the demeanor of being passive, never talking about politics. That was not Farina at all. She was (laughs) tall. Some people even referred to her as masculinely tall. Um, And when I went in and did my research looking at her, her wedding dress size was the same exact size as mine. And we were the same height. So I thought, ooh, I wonder if I'd be (laughs) considered masculinely tall. And in fact, fat is what a lot of people called her. Um, Even though I don't think she was fat, but she wasn't that like, tiny tiny figure yeah her skin was not that pale ivory color it was um an olive color and in fact during the war uh, when she was in richmond there were some other elite women who referred to her as quote unquote a squaw and suspected that she could be mulatto because her skin was not super super white 
So she was also extremely intelligent. She had been partially educated in the North. So again, red flag going into the Civil War, the wife of you know, the Confederate president, and you have ties to the North. Um, but she liked to talk about politics. She liked to talk about literature. She laughed raucously at things that she found funny, which, of course, you just don't do back then. It's the little <laughs> giggle or something like that. If you even uh, got the joke, right? Yeah, if you right? got the yeah. joke, exactly. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. But she would regularly take on men in conversation and, and want to dive into deep, deep topics. And she meets Jefferson Davis. She's invited to his plantation called the Hurricane um, in Mississippi when she's, I think it was 1843, and then they get married in 1845. Jefferson Davis has already been married to the daughter of President Zachary Taylor. And... Um, Taylor's daughter dies within a year of Jefferson Davis and, and her, Sarah, getting married. And this never really, Jefferson Davis never gets over it. Um, and in fact, on his honeymoon with Verena, he takes her I'm to, get mad, aren't I? to the first wife's grave. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> But this is, you know, in Verena's, you know, family, they say, well, Jefferson Davis, he comes from wealth, hundreds of acres, plantation, slave owner, politically connected. So they think, you know, she's going to be pretty well off. But, you know, it starts out emotionally rocky from the start, and that only continues throughout their marriage. Um, and when they first move up to Washington, D.C., Jefferson Davis is, of course, a, a U.S. senator. He's in the House of Representatives. So they move up there before the Civil War starts, obviously. And they have a very active social life, and Verena loves it. She loves Washington, D.C. She makes a lot of really good friends who will eventually cast their lot with the Union, not the Confederacy. She's very well liked there, because I think she fits in better with kind of northern-ish urban life. Um, things change dramatically, though, when she gets to Richmond. Um, and that's really where the story gets super interesting. Well, if I can stop you and just kind of go back a little bit. There, there was a... So when you're talking about uh, Jefferson Davis, he went through a, a pretty extended, I think I saw a several year length of kind of hermit-like life where he was really mourning his first wife. Mm -hmm. And, and um, ultimately, I think I saw maybe eight or nine years, something like that, where he basically just kind of fell off the radar altogether. Yeah. Um, and I, did that pose some kind of concerns for Verena's family or were there were there other concerns originally with with yeah are we signing our daughter up with somebody who might not be emotionally stable <laughs> right yeah. right I think honestly you know they were concerned it's kind of that deep south culture they they need to make sure their daughter is married off to someone who's wealthy enough to take care of her maybe because his family is so prominent he can help raise up their family um, her original her last name is Howell Verena Howell um, so maybe her association with the Davises can improve the Howells' reputation. So I don't think they were super, if they noticed the red flags, I'm not sure that that was really a top priority okay. for them. Okay. What about any kind of other differences? that You touched real quickly on politics. Yeah. The families were of different political persuasions, right? Is that my understanding? or? So it mostly had to do with the fact that Verena, Verena's family had ties to the North. Um, and Verena personally was pro-union but pro-slavery whereas the davis family of course jefferson davis is pro-secession and and pro-slavery so that's where there's a big difference that comes in okay um but that having that kind of what she even called herself a half breed um because of her family ties to the north and half of her ties to the south really made her different in a lot of people's eyes now since the women in the society that she grew up in were kind of mean girls. <laughs> um, the girls that she spent time with in Philadelphia, mm -hmm. now did she end up, do you know, like forming really good friendships with these women or was this kind of like an ongoing problem that she had where she was so different yeah. and more boisterous, yes. more of a modern woman yeah, yeah, than, in some ways. than sure. most of these women that they were like also mean girls? Sure. So I, I'm not sure about her relationships from Philadelphia. I, I don't know of any that I can trace necessarily to there, but I do know that in her 15 years that she lived with Jefferson Davis in Washington, D.C., um, prior to them moving, you know, first back to Mississippi and then um, eventually to Richmond, Virginia for the war, um, 
I she made great friendships there um, strong friendships with women who were the wives and daughters of some of the the leading members of the, the Lincoln administration um, and uh, the postmaster general for instance she became really good friends with with his uh, wife before the war um, and she maintains those relationships during the Civil War um, to the extent that you know during the war sometimes people are suspect people doubt their loyalties they they do open letters they open mail she suspects that her mail is being read because she is writing frequently to those women who still live in washington dc during the civil war and uh, she writes in some of her own correspondence i know my mail is being read uh so i can't be as candid um as i as i could have been before Mm -hmm. so i do know from the dc years she maintains a very strong ties um but i don't know from philadelphia per se okay there was a pretty big age difference. I think you t- touched yes. on, I think he, she was introduced to Jefferson and Davis in, in about 1843 or something like that. Yeah. And she was around 17 or 18 at 17. that time. 17. Yep. Okay. How yep. old was he? Or approximately. Um, I, don't, I don't mean to put you on the spot. I'm sorry. But No, you know, I should know this. Um, I, I forget off the top of my head, but it was significant. It was greater than 10 years. I want to say maybe like 15 or so. Okay. Um, if not, maybe a little bit more. But yes, a definite difference in, in age and kind of not maturity because she was obviously very, very mature for her age. Um, but in terms of life experiences with him having been married before and gone through this deep, you know, personal loss. And she's, you know, fresh and ready to go as a, as a 17 year old when she meets him. There's a big difference. And then when they pretty quickly moved to D.C. after their wedding. Yes. right Within a couple of years. Um, is there something... You already touched on the fact that she loves D.C. She's thriving yeah. there. Jefferson Davis is not so much, right? He doesn't really like it. He prefers the plantation. and Yeah. He ultimately, at that point in time, he leaves her an extended period of time for the Mexican War. Is he that does. correct? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Was there anything else going on in the, in the relationship at that time? or So, they... Um so yes, you're backtrack a little bit. Yes, Jefferson Davis felt much more at home with the plantation life. She was never super comfortable in rural life. She always felt much more at home in the, the hubbub of a big city, particularly a northern city, one that was very cosmopolitan, um, things like that. Um, they do. They have six children who survive, you know, birth and all of that. Um, but what, their first child, Samuel, will actually die. He's two years old, and I want to say it's. I forget the exact dates when he was born. It might have been after the Mexican War, in fact. Um, but that's when they start raising the family. Um, but, you know, when, when Jefferson Davis goes off and does his thing in the war, Verena, you know, loves being an independent woman. And mm-hmm. she's fine. And she's known as a social hostess in Washington, D.C. She has very intelligent, very um, socially bright people around her all the time. Uh, and so she's she's very sad, uh, obviously, when the Civil War does come, that she has to leave that life. She also admits basically from day one when the southern states secede, she confesses in personal letters to her family, this isn't going to work. Wow. Secession is not going to work, and we aren't going to win this war after the war officially breaks out. Um Again, some of that gets leaked. I was the just going to ask. I was just going to ask if that made <laughs> yeah. like, public headlines. Would, yes. Yeah, wow. And people doubted whether she was fully committed to the Southern War effort because of her Northern family ties. Mm. Um, she also didn't want Jefferson Davis to become president of the Confederacy. Um, he was a pretty sickly man. He was sickly for m- much of his life, including during the war. And she, again, admitted he doesn't have the Constitution for this. I mean, physically as well as emotionally and mentally, which, of course, is a very emasculating thing to have said about you. Yeah. Um, she didn't think that he could handle it. Um, so, And those sentiments go all throughout the war. She was still writing to her family saying, we shouldn't have seceded. You know, I no longer believe in states' rights, she says at one point. Um, I just want a Republican form of government. Uh, She's miserable just because of all the stresses put on her. She loses another child tragically in 1864 when she's living in Richmond. Five-year-old boy, Joseph, who falls out of the second story um, of the Confederate White House. She's about seven months pregnant at the time with another baby. Um, And so that loss, of course, is very much pitted against Mary Lincoln. Um, The fact that Verena is seen to be so emotional, you know, despondent about how the war is going, despondent about losing 
her her child in this very tragic way um kind of critical of her her husband or not really thinking he's up to the task all of those comparisons have been made between mary lincoln and verena davis um but the war years were the most miserable years of her life she confesses wow. yeah that's the one thing about like pictures of her that that famous picture of them sitting side yes, by side yes yes she, she looks so sad miserable. yeah yeah she looks like yeah like like there is an emotional trauma happening and i always when i looked at her felt so bad yeah because i'm like i can't even imagine mm -hmm. like i'm sure she like you don't hear about her at any point being like my my husband is president and i'm so excited about it yeah. and let's get She's this going yeah so you know that behind the scenes she has to be like kind of making a sacrifice yes, here absolutely absolutely and you know, she she tries her best. She tries her best to put on a, a good face. She, when she's in Richmond and she's at the Confederate White House, she is hosting you know weekly public receptions for most of the war. Um, she wants to help out with working in the hospitals. Uh, she tries. She goes in for the first time and she can't stand the sight of so much gore and blood and she nearly passes out and Jefferson Davis says well you shouldn't be in there anyway there's no place for a lady and so from then on out she decides well my best contribution to charity and to helping the war effort you know the hospitals is is driving to the hospitals and dropping off a bunch of food and supplies and things like that people in Richmond immediately latch upon that and they say she didn't want to go into the hospitals because she doesn't really care about the Southern boys. She just wants to drive around her flashy carriage and, you know, drop off, showcase how much wealth she has. Um, so they spin that tale quite a bit. Um, and that's the case with a lot of the things that she does during the war. Um, again, the fact that at her public reception, she's talking openly about politics with men and having debates with them. The fact that, you know, her, her dress, her comportment, um, is not like classic FFV, First Families of Virginia. People in Richmond at the time, I mean, as, as cosmopolitan as the city was with business and industry and the, the domestic slave trade and all of that, there were lots of people coming and going even before the war started. But socially, it was very insular. And you had to come from a certain line of breeding, you know, classic traditional Virginia family in order to really fit in. She obviously didn't have that. She's coming from the Deep South. Lydia Johnston, the wife of General Joseph Johnston, will refer to her as a coarse Western belle because of her manners. Um, she doesn't have the comportment. She doesn't have the look. Uh, she doesn't have the breeding. And then because of her ties to the North, people are suspicious of her. She can never seem to do anything right in the eyes of many of these women. Um, sometimes she's criticized for dressing too flashy. There are all these women who are writing snarky letters to each other about the Lady Queen and Empress Verena. And do you know she wears a crown of fake jewels on her head? I mean, all this stuff that isn't true. And on the other hand, they're saying, well, she doesn't have the classic figure. She's fat. She's dowdy. So she just can't. She just can't seem to win yeah. in in so many regards. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that's and a I lot wonder on if anybody's a, plate. Yeah, I'm sure, yeah. Uh, I wonder if that's because she was so not traditional, or I don't know. Like in my head, I'm always picturing like the hierarchy. You know, if you're the president's wife, right? Exactly. There's going to be somebody there that's going to like bow down. You yeah. know, like they're gonna. If they want to be have some place in society, that is the person that they're going to put on the pedestal. Right. And you're telling me she she wasn't. That's fascinating. Not yeah, not for a lot of women. Now eventually she makes inroads and she has kind of her own court of ladies is what they refer to it as the women who would come to her her parlor teas and you know the more private exclusive events. Um, but there were some women the the most standout bells of Richmond who never wanted to be a part of that court. In fact, they wanted to make sure she was excluded from it. Mary Chestnut, of course, famous diarist, she starts out really not liking Verena mm -hmm. and thinking, again, now Mary Chestnut comes from South Carolina, so deep south, or deeper south. Um, she's more of kind of the congenial Southern Belle in terms of 
the looks and she can get the comportment right. But she obviously, she also has some sass to her <laughs> um, and she doesn't always conform in all the right ways. And I think that's eventually what pushes her over the edge. And she and Verena become very close um, after the first, I don't know, four or five months in Richmond. And she comes to her defense many, many times and just can't believe how horribly Verena is being treated. Um, so there, there were some ladies who were very loyal to her, but the original classic Virginia, you know, Richmond FFV type women really wanted to, to stay far away from her. That's interesting. I, I, I apologize for going way back in time, but um, <laughs> one of the things that caught my attention when I was just kind of superficially trying to get some talking points for today was was there was mention of during the engagement, um, there was the engagement was announced. There was supposed to be a fantastically lavish wedding. I think at uh, Big Brother Davis's uh, plantation yes, or something yeah. that was kind of called off almost at the last minute. Do you know anything about why does does anybody know about why i mean I, obviously they reconciled and they went through with the marriage later on but sure any any reasons like were, were there underlying ripples of discontent between the like husband and wife prior to that or sarah or, you yeah, know yeah. Sarah came, Knox Taylor, back, yeah. Yeah. came back into the the emotional yeah. vortex i think i mean they were having troubles during that time um and i'm not sure if that was the key thing that shut down that initial initially planned wedding um, but they were, I mean, Jefferson Davis would often tell Verena, like, you've got to get your emotions under control. You know, you're way too immature, basically, for someone who's about to marry me. Um, and Verena took that very harshly because she... And who wouldn't? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. She's very obviously mature, but she wanted to, to be more outspoken than he wanted her to be. And she was upset that, you know, Sarah still looms so large in... Jefferson Davis's memory and she she wanted that kind of cleared and rectified before they were married and it just wasn't so I'm not sure if there were logistical issues as well um, but I do know that they were undergoing a lot of emotional challenges sure. yeah and then I think even once if I understood correctly once they do get married and <laughs> they do the little honeymoon and including the visit to the grave etc um, they move on to into a property that again big brother mm -hmm. owns and and at that point, almost immediately, I think she recalls feeling kind of like controlled. And yes, can you explain a little bit more what was going on at that time? Yeah, absolutely. So she does move into yeah. Big Brother is is an interesting character in her life. Um, Jefferson Davis's Big Brother, um, but yes. So Jefferson Davis and really the whole Davis family have very rigid prescriptions for the kind of life that Verena should lead. She should be subservient. She should be you know your classic domestic you know, housekeeper kind of type, um, you know, staying inside, not letting your, your skin get browned too much and things like that. And Verena, you know, wanted to be outside. She wanted to take on chores that maybe weren't traditionally feminine, might even be considered masculine. She had ideas about additions to the house that they were living in and changes that she wanted to make that diverged from what the Davis family wanted her to do and the fighting that broke out because of that hurt Verena a lot and she just she didn't get along with the extended family and I think pretty much right away the Davis family realized that Verena just came from a very different upbringing and they felt like she was a drag on their relationship and a drag on the family unfortunately I wonder if you don't have that support from your own extended family the family you married into mm -hmm. who in an ideal world is supposed to be your support system right and then you move this war happens you come to a society in which there's people who are not supporting you i wonder how much psychological damage that does because you probably just feel like there's nobody out there you can rely on sure nobody that you can really show who you are as an actual human too right. and that's that's awful yeah. right. to know that yeah. that's the life she probably led right when you're dragging ass out of bed the hairs must up on your head you picture the 20th main and you're happy once again fight the battle against being slow with Little Ground Top Bro. Little Ground Top is addressing Gettysburg's first coffee brand. 
and we're proud to team up with Bantam Roasters to bring you this medium blend with notes of cacao, wildflowers, and toasted sugar. Get your bag in whole bean or grounded to your coffee making specifications. Find out for yourself why Bantam Roasters can't keep Little Ground Top on the shelves and is inundated with online orders each week. Go to addressinggettysburg.com slash cafe or stop in at Bantam Roasters at 82 Steinware Avenue in Gettysburg. Fight the battle against being slow with Little Ground Top, bro. I mean, sis. The life she probably led. Right. And that's why she writes so openly to her family, even when she knows that some of those letters are are being read or might be read, is that writing to her mother at first, um, you know, is really one of the only outlets for her, um, that she doesn't have a husband who really supports her. Her in-laws really don't care for her. Then when she gets up to... When she she's doing great in D.C., she has that network, that support network. But then when she's in Richmond, she loses it again. She's kind of forbidden from connecting with that old network. Um, so she starts writing to her family again. Um, so, yeah, she's she's kind of like a, a lost soul in that regard. She and Mary Chestnut, as I said, they do connect. They do have a strong relationship and they do confide in each other. And you can, in fact, still read about some of those exchanges in, in Mary Chestnut's published diary. Um, but in terms of having a lot of people right there around you who support you, they weren't there. But again, Verena, she has to keep up the face, the facade. It's mm-hmm. part of Southern society, of course. The facade matters in so many ways. How you look, how you comport yourself, who you're friends with, where you go you mm-hmm. know, in public, what theaters you attend, what charities you contribute to, all of that is kind of being logged by people to see like, are you worthy of a position of leadership? And if you're not, then people begin to wonder, why did Jefferson Davis marry her? And so there are all these kind of intricate, unofficial politics that are involved yeah. with what Verena does. Um, and uh, she, she does try to maintain that public face as much as she can, but you read some of her letters and they're just, they're heartbreaking. And the longer the war goes on, the more despondent she gets, the more she realizes this was all such a mistake. But, you know, I'm, I'm part of a sinking ship. Yeah, but even with Mary Chestnut, like as a support system, if I remember correctly, reading that diary, I remember thinking at the time, this woman travels. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> An inordinate amount of times yeah. in, in the course of that diary. So she's not in D.C. or in Richmond. Correct. All the time. Yeah, she's going back home. South she's Carolina. everywhere. She's visiting family, friends. Yeah. yeah, so like, so she's not there to be a support system yeah. every day the whole four years of the war. Sure, sure. Yeah. No, that's absolutely true. And another common theme I kind of saw, even between just Jefferson and Verena, was just an ongoing kind of ebb and flow of maybe some depression between the both of them obviously they were through some very hectic uh, disappointing life experiences but even before you know any of the children died or the war broke out or anything there were some if i'm understanding correctly there were some letters that that, that survived to this day basically exposing mutual dis discontent and difficulties and things like that when he was in the war in Mexico and yeah. that kind of keeps going throughout when he's even after the the war when they're yeah. separated and things like that and there's I, th- I think well, I'm sure we'll get to it but allegations of infidelity and things mm-hmm. like that I mean it, this isn't like the storybook wedding yeah. you know mm-hmm. or or yeah, absolutely or not. marriage which is also I mean from I, moment one yeah right yeah. right yeah, <laughs> yeah, let's, yeah. yeah. let's go to the we'll graveyard honey like, yeah. Yeah. after that beautiful <laughs> ceremony <Yeah. laughs> but I, I guess that you know I never again full disclosure I don't know much about her coming into this but I'm very just shocked I guess I, I just assumed naively that you know um you know southern gentleman this what you know yeah his wife can do no wrong she her husband can do no wrong they're going to be side by side and the confederacy all the way and you know right. I, I just i'm very very interested right. to hear about a, a woman going through her own experiences struggling with her own intelligence and and you know kind of being right dissuaded from you know engaging in that kind of sure. life so so um I, I apologize because I kind of cut you off. You were already talking about, um, you know, the war had broken out and the, the, the second son had passed away now uh, tragically while in the White House, the mm-hmm. Confederate White House. Um, so ultimately, I mean, no, spoiler alert, the Confederacy <laughs> loses, right? So, what? Uh, I know, right? So, Wait, back uh, up. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Alternative history here. Um, 
but so okay you know there we've touched on the struggles and stuff throughout the war and she's not getting much credibility or respect from the yeah. southern ladies in in the confederacy ultimately we know the war ends mm -hmm. uh ultimately jefferson davis um flees for lack of a better way of saying it does is verena with him and the, is the family with him or are they separated or so when the family leaves the white house they are separate uh from him initially um, because there's this big plan that they're going to set up a new Confederate government okay. in Danville, Virginia. And that, of course, never happens. Verena flees with um, the children and she takes some valuables from the White House, you know, personal valuables. And then they eventually reconnect. And I'm not exactly sure where the reconnection happens, but of course, he's captured. They're all captured together okay. um, in, in May um, in Irwinville, Georgia. And what happens there, of course, is another very famous incident where Jefferson Davis knows, of course, that he's being pursued. Uh, there are other members of the Treasury and, you know, his, his administration uh, who have split off in different areas. They're also being pursued by the Federals. And so Jefferson Davis knows that there, there's this cohort of, of Federals who are coming up on his tail. And we're still not exactly sure what the real answer is. But when he is found and captured by the Federals, he is wearing Verena's cloak. And all of these rumors break out. Was he dressing like his wife as a disguise, trying to get away from these captors by taking on the persona of a woman, which, of course, deeply emasculating, embarrassing. Um, he really kind of snaps back at that. He snaps back even at Verena, like you know, because I have your cloak on, it makes it look like you're protecting me and I'm emasculated and you're the protector. We just don't know what's going on. Verena says that it's because, again, he's sickly. It was a chillier morning. And so she threw his cloak on him at an earlier time and he was still wearing it when he was captured. Yeah. We don't know, but all, this makes the newspapers. Jefferson Davis even captured in Verena Davis's dress. Of course, he was not wearing a hoop skirt when he's captured. Like that just, it didn't happen. But well, he that's did have the, the cloak image on. that everybody <laughs> had in their heads, I'm sure. Exactly. Like the hoop skirt and the bonnet. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so, yeah. And then from that point, of course, they do get separated. He is sent to, to Fort Monroe for two years. He's in horrible health. Verena Davis visits him numerous times. He's getting worse and worse. She tries to petition to get him out of there, move to a house instead of a cell, um, has a special doctor come in to try and take care of him. Mm -hmm. Eventually, he's released. He refuses to take the oath of allegiance. Um, he never takes it. And so from then on out, you know that, you know, they're going to be suspect by the federal government, obviously, for a lot of reasons. But the fact that he refuses to take the oath uh, is one of them. Does but she have to take it? She does not because she's not technically a combatant or citizen. Uh, yeah, gotcha, gotcha. she can't vote. Yeah. So she doesn't have to do Oh, that. I never. Oh, yeah. duh. OK. Never thought about that. Sorry. Yeah. 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 So and then yeah, the their post war lives are are just a disaster. I just, just figured a continuation. First lady of the Confederacy. I don't care if you vote or not. Right. I'd want to know. <laughs> right. Yeah. They don't bother. They don't bother with the women. Um, they of course are hot to trot on the the high ranking Confederate politicians and generals and officers and all of that. And certainly, if you want to serve in any political office afterward, you have to take that oath. Um, but it's a matter of pride for Jefferson Davis, and he never. Mm -hmm never takes it i don't know if i knew that actually i never i probably never got any thought to it to be honest but i don't think i ever knew that he just outright refused from from that point on because i think lee does right lee ultimately signs something and it yeah. gets lost for decades or something and you know, yeah, yeah there are a whole bunch of them that yeah. agree to take it even some of the most like stalwart people behind the lost cause mo movement you know mm -hmm. wade hampton people like that they sign the oath oh. um, of course they have political futures ahead of them so they know that they yeah. need to sign jefferson davis probably suspected he would never be allowed to get involved politically again after this um does a refusal translate into exile i mean is he forced to leave the country or are they allowed to stay here you they're allowed to stay they just can't vote they can't hold political office you're just you're just kind of there, there. <laughs> okay yeah. okay cool. so they do actually they they not maybe for a uh, long-term inhabitant, but they, they go out of country. Is they that do. correct after the war? Can you touch on that a little bit? Yeah, so they um, they do travel quite a bit. Um, so after the war, Jefferson Davis, the, the Davis family loses their plantation. Um, it's in fact, it's confiscated um, by the federal government. And so they have no place to live after the war. So they're kind of doing this traveling circuit through Europe. 
um, an interesting kind of social circle arises in Europe after the war with ex-Confederates who are basically being taken in by uh, Parisian saloniers and people who are, you know, kind of the aristocracy in Europe. Paris is really good about that. Yes. Yeah. They're yeah. really good about taking in old, <laughs> <laughs> high-ranking people from other countries. Yes. yes. Yeah, at that time. Yeah. So they are, yeah, they're doing kind of the grand tour of Europe, living off of other people, but also trying to kind of rekindle some of the, the old social aspects, at least, of the old South uh, with the salons and the you know, the, the kind of elite society that they've cultivated. Um, so they're, they're, they are doing that quite a bit. Eventually, um, Jefferson Davis is, um, is offered a home not to own, but to live in with this woman named Sarah Dorsey in Mississippi. And that home is called Beauvoir. And Sarah Dorsey will take in the whole Davis family and she feels bad for him. She wants to support the Davis family. So they come back to Mississippi and uh, Sarah Dorsey will eventually help Jefferson Davis write his memoirs. Now, Verena Davis never feels comfortable at Beauvoir. There's uh, yeah. throngs of people um, who are stopping by every day to ask questions and try to get autographs and things like that. Um, it's not her house. You know, yeah. she's being put up by another woman. And there are some rumors floating that Jefferson Davis and Sarah Dorsey, you know, might have had something going on. Also, Verena's health is not good by this time. Um, she eventually dies of heart disease, essentially. Mm -hmm. And the the humidity and the heat down there at Beauvoir is too much for her. So she actually takes off and goes back to Europe by herself. And she leaves Jefferson Davis there with Sarah Dorsey alone. Of course, this is when the yeah. rumors really pick up. And we don't know really if there's any truth to them or not. But she's in Europe. She's touring around. She's, again, kind of doing her thing. She writes to Jefferson Davis, and he's you know saying, you know, I don't know if you should come back. You know, it's actually it's pretty good for your health to be away and so she that feels she like feel oh. really wanted yeah. supported <laughs> loved exactly <laughs> and she doesn't necessarily want to come back either because she doesn't like living at Beauvoir but she knows she can't just live you know in Europe on the backs of other people so eventually she does come back to Mississippi um, and, and Jefferson Davis is very sickly by that time and he eventually passes away in 1889 um, and immediately, almost immediately, she takes their youngest daughter, Winnie, who was born in 1864, and they moved to New York City. And that's kind of where the next phase of her life takes off. Now, when the war ends, I know she had this correspondence going mm -hmm. during the war. Um, when the war ends, does she write to people immediately following? And is it like a, oh, thank God? Or is it like... More of like a jubilant, oh, thank God. <laughs> like, what is her feelings when the war ends? Like, like her correspondence with her northern friends yeah, or in terms or just of anybody? in general, because, yeah. you know, like, I don't know how I would feel in her position. Would I be relieved? Yeah. Would I be jubilant that now we can move on to something different? <laughs> yeah. Um, would I be scared? You know, like, I don't know what my, my emotional state would be. Sure. Yeah, that. I mean... Obviously, immediately when she flees Richmond, she's terrified. She knows she has to take care of the kids and all of that. But I think she is honestly relieved. Once it's all said and done, the war is over. She does worry about Jefferson Davis's health. She really thinks he's going to die in Fortress Monroe because his health is so bad. But once that gets cleared, there is significant relief. And in her mind, it's just time to move on. You know, yeah. it's just it's time to move on. And of course, this is when you know we have the very early threads of the unreconstructed South and the lost cause get started. And I'm not denying that I'm not denying that Farina ever participated in that because she did certainly tour around. Jefferson Davis gave speeches. She would often be asked by the UDC, United Daughters of the Confederacy, to give speeches and she'd say, okay, fine. But that wasn't her passion. She just wanted to move on. She wanted both sides to 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 reconcile. Um and she had always had different views about slavery than Jefferson Davis and a lot of people from her class. She, she obviously, you know, comes from a slaveholding world, but she refers to slaves as human beings with frailties. The fact of the matter is she called them human beings. Mm -hmm. Jefferson Davis viewed them as basically animals mm -hmm. and, and, you know, 
very blunt terms. Um, and so when, when emancipation happens and, you know, the war ends and four million black people who were once enslaved are free, it's not as much of a world shattering thing for Verena as it is for other people. I'm not at all saying that she was a, you know, fan of equal rights or wanted to befriend a lot of black people, not at all, but she's not shattered even in the though, way that a lot of people were. Even though she was mulatto? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> that was called a callback. Yeah. Yeah. Well done. They call it in the yeah. industry. I'm yeah. still yeah. learning. All yes. right. Was, <laughs> <laughs> exactly so, like that. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so okay. So you said that you know after Jefferson passes away, uh, she and the the youngest child moved to New York. And yeah. How she outlives Jefferson qu- quite some time, right? I mean, she does. So Verena dies in 1906. Um, Jefferson Davis is 1889. So it is quite a long time that she lives without him. Does she ever remarry or? She does not remarry. Um, when she moves to, to New York, um, she, CVS Pharmacy is calling me for anybody who is curious. Um, <laughs> um, so anyway, yeah. So when she moves to New York, she has her, her youngest daughter um, with her, Winnie. And Winnie is known by, by this point as um, the daughter of the Confederacy. She's born during the war. She's the last of the Davis children born. Can you imagine having that hanging over yeah, your head? No. From birth, yeah. I know. I no, no, thank you. Like a, a like a propaganda, like a rallying cry, oh, she, right? Yeah, like, yeah, when she, she definitely was is. Born, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And so after the war, um, you know, Southern heritage groups, the Sons of Confederate Veterans, United Daughters of the Confederacy, they all want the daughter of the Confederacy to come speak. If Jefferson Davis isn't available before he dies, they want Winnie. Oh. And after he dies, they don't want Verena. They want Winnie because Winnie is the real deal. She's born of, of both their blood. Um, and they're most concerned with Jefferson Davis. So she does a, a big speaking tour and um, she's often, you know, invited South to do things. Verena is often invited South to do things too by the UDC. Um, but they refuse to pay for her food and her lodging when she goes down South to give speeches or attend, you know, grand meetings of the UDC. Um, and when she submits receipts for reimbursement, people were truly offended. Like, how dare she want to be reimbursed? She lives in the North now. She lives in New York City. How oh. could she do this? Um, so she stops going to these, to these well, yeah. commitments. <laughs> I um, don't blame her. <laughs> and she casts her lot with New York City. Mm-hmm. And what's even more interesting is that she takes on a, a public role as a, a writer for Joseph Pulitzer's New York World newspaper. And she's a very active writer. And Winnie is also uh, writing during this time. She writes a few novels. Um, But again, it's kind of a rare, if Jefferson Davis were alive, he would never approve of this thing, that she's writing for a newspaper, a major newspaper as a woman. Um, She's writing about a wide variety of topics. She threw off all of that. Issues, yes. You can tell. She threw off all of that. All of that Southern Belle. I've been, you know what, I'm done. Yeah. You can tell. And then when, you know, initially some of the UDC groups who were kinder to her said, well, you know, we'll we'll pay for a home for you to live in if you just come back to to the South. And she says, no, I'm happier here. I'm healthier here in New York City. Um, And basically gives them the kiss off and says, I'm going to support myself. Again, very not late 19th century female. Um, She has an apartment there where she hosts some very lavish teas and parlor parties she makes befriends a lot of northern ladies um she meets booker t washington and has a pretty civil by all accounts conversation with him and she befriends one of her best friends in her later years is julia grant the wife of general grant so of course people from the deep south they look at grant you know it's grant sherman and lincoln who are the evil yeah, yeah. yeah. um and the <laughs> fact that client. she and julia are all about we got to move on it's time for reconciliation that raises a lot of eyebrows but she loves julia julia is very smart she's very um intellectually focused in her conversation she's not just kind of a gossiper and a rumor monger and uh, she spends some of her her final days in in great conversation with julia um which will mar her reputation in some ways in the south even more so than it was before but it's um it's of great gratitude um, to Verena that those were, again, kind of reliving some of the, the Washington, D.C. days. I'm curious, when you say that Winnie was kind of sought after, what, would she, was she a little bit more 
willing to be engaged or she was a little bit more of like a raw raw like spokesperson or just going through the motions or what what vibe do you get for that i think because she grew up from such a young age as being adored as this you know the last child of the davis family she was born in 1864 it was kind of she knew that was what was to be expected of her um she really she loved her father a lot she thought a lot of him um and uh she obviously understood that there were differences between what her father's expectations for her mother were and what her mother wanted out of life. So I think she could kind of see both sides, but she really had a, an affection and a loyalty for Jefferson Davis that she was willing to do all of these things um, publicly, especially in his memory after he dies. Interesting. Did that cause any rift between mom and her? Or would, uh, mom just kind of said, do your thing. And it's not. Yeah, yeah. I think Verena was just kind of like, you know, she's she is who she is and that's her identity. And mm-hmm. Verena was not one to necessarily stop anybody else from doing their own thing. Um, if it was different from what she wanted to do, she just didn't want other people to tell her, you have to do this. Gotcha, gotcha. Makes sense. Yeah. What a fascinating lady. I had no yes. idea. Uh, well, me neither. <laughs> no idea. Me neither. And I... I am going to look at her in a completely different way from this point forward. I want to know more about her time in New York, because whenever you think about the post-Civil War in New York City, we start to get into those big names, Mm -hmm. those big society names, the Industrial Revolution names. I don't know, hobnobbing with some Vanderbilts or, you know, what was she doing that or is she kind of like you know, below that in society? or I think she was willing to talk to just about anyone. Honestly, she if you were intellectual, she wanted to talk to you. Um, it wasn't really a matter of wealth for her. It was more so if you could carry a smart conversation. She was interested. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. yeah. What about, uh, did she write her own memoirs or is what kind of resources can you point our audience to if they want to do like a deeper dive about Verena? Yeah, so she doesn't have any kind of full length memoir that she did for herself. She did also help um, Jefferson Davis a little bit with his memoirs, but Sarah Dorsey also was, was key to that effort. She helps to get them over the finish line to get them published posthumously, um, but she does not... She does not leave behind, you know, my story of the war. Um, So really piecing her story together comes from a lot of her personal correspondence, um, looking at um, diaries and and memoirs of other women that she interacted with, even some of the men. Um, She befriended a couple of the male politicians in Richmond, a couple generals. It's really good friends with Judah Benjamin, um, who was a member of the Confederate cabinet. He was Jewish, which of course... During the Civil War, especially in the South, that was not Jewish people were suspect. And mm-hmm. so a lot of people, even even though he was high ranking in the Confederate cabinet, people kind of backed away from him. But she didn't that didn't bother her at all. She loved him. She thought that he was very smart and a conversationalist. So, you know, there are correspondences there. Um, but really it's 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 piecing together the primary sources from all these different um you know, correspondences and letters and such. There was a really good book um, that was written about her in, oh gosh, 20, 2007, 2006, somewhere around there by Joan Cashin. Um, and it's a full length study of Verena, right from birth through death. And she really opened my eyes toward these human struggles that Verena went through. And the ways in which she didn't fit the mold, the ways in which she sometimes did. Um, I think sometimes when I talk about Verena, because I've been studying her and writing about her for so long, people are thinking like, you know, you forgive her for all of her faults. She was a slaveholder. She came from slaveholding society, et cetera, et cetera. I don't. She was human. She Mm -hmm. had faults. I'm not saying that she was some like super modern progressive woman, but she was way beyond the classic mold from her time. And much more complicated than we would initially think that she was. There's also a novel by Charles Frazier, who wrote Cold Mountain, that came out a few years ago called Verena. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Which is more of kind of like an artistic picture of her. It's kind of a lot of flashbacks and stuff with artistic license, of course. It's a novel. But it actually has a lot of really good kind of kaleidoscopic moments about what I think Verena probably was living through in her life, which is always flashing back to former moments and trying to wonder 
did I make the right decision here, but I'm here now, and so I can't change anything, and where do I imagine my life going? Um, so that's an interesting read, too, if people want kind of a, a more artistic rendition. You know, something we can all uh, assemble, yeah. Yeah. You know, like yeah. associate with. I mean, you know, everybody has not necessarily regrets. I don't want to say it that way, but what ifs, you know, like what if this happened or what if that happened? Or sure. What if I, yeah, that's that's fascinating that, sure. you know, we think of these people, you know, these people, the Civil War people, like, of you know, such long ago, they're out of touch, like we don't, you know, but they're literally, like you said, they were human yeah. beings. I mean, this is, you know, with all the... And they're complex, you yeah. know, they're, they're you got to know them for warts and all. And again, you know, not hold them up as in the spotlight as being you know, godlike figures, but also not just trash them because some of their ideas or beliefs or backgrounds do not jive with, you know, what we do in the 21st century. Sure. Um, but it really helps to unpack mm-hmm. all of the different threads of, of her being. And she's not the only one, of course, who has such a complicated past. Yeah. And it's just, you know, reveals the importance of doing good history and, and varied history. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Mm-hmm. So now that we've gone through her life, why do you think, in your professional opinion, that she is so overlooked, that she is not That's talked about question. as much as, like, say, her husband and or Mary Todd Lincoln? Yeah, yeah. You know, it's a good question. Um, I don't know whether if people people are just willing to write her off, be as, you know, just knowing her. She was the wife of Jefferson Davis. Um, so we don't really need to know a lot about the wife. You know, we just need to know about Jefferson Davis. Um, Mary Lincoln, obviously, because Lincoln was Lincoln and the Union won the war and he becomes this martyr, people are very much interested in all of the different facets of his life. So I think, honestly, that helped to shine even more light on Mary for better or for worse. Um, Jefferson Davis. I think people know and care a lot more about people like Robert E. Lee and Stonewall Jackson than they do Jefferson Davis when it comes down to it. So that's another reason why maybe we don't know as much about Farina. Um, But also because she's so complicated. I think people kind of write her off as like, "Ah, she was just like the passive wife of Jefferson Davis and we don't need to know more. Jefferson Davis wasn't necessarily universally beloved in the confederacy like robert e lee or stonewall jackson were so we care more about their personal lives so i think it's kind of a a variety of factors i mean i knew about sarah i knew more about his first wife than i knew about her and and i don't know why i don't know where that comes (laughs) from yeah i feel like like at some point i know i feel like at some point (laughs) this was something grandma was on i have no idea because it was like a president it was the daughter of a president that's probably why gotcha yeah so that was always a big deal in my house growing up the presidents yeah Yeah. you know so i don't know suspicious too you know did did she kind of get a little bit of the the long street treatment Mm. right like she wasn't 100 percent invested so the udc kind of i don't want to say wrote her off but i mean there's no reason to go to bat for her absolutely absolutely i think (laughs) it definitely is like that um i think uh you know i i don't know at all that she and long street ever talked ever personally um during the war after um but i think if they did they probably would have found a lot more in common um but i think absolutely that plays a part in it i mean the udc is active in propping up a lot of southern women um but they don't make really much of an effort yeah. at all to do that with Farina because of the obvious reasons. That's interesting. And, you know, it's interesting. They're, she and Jefferson Davis and their children um, are buried in, in Richmond today. And when Jefferson Davis died, everyone thought he was going to be buried in Mississippi because that's, you know, native soil. Yeah. And Verena said, no, he's going to be buried in Richmond. And people fought her about that they said no 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 he's a mississippi and he's going to come back to mississippi oh, wow. and she said nope he's going to richmond like that's where he served his official time with the confederacy but also she was worried about the weather in deep south mississippi with the hurricanes and such she was worried that his body would be destroyed oh. um yeah interesting because she she did really love him she did this. really care yeah. yeah so she thought he would be safer in in richmond um not subjected to the heavy rains and and, and the weather um, of that particular portion in Mississippi where he could have been buried. Um, she also knew that um, it would probably be easier to visit him in Richmond than it would be in deep south Mississippi dealing with all of the, you know, people who were fighting her tooth and nail throughout the war and the UDC groups and all of that. So 
so they're buried in this position of prominence, of course, in Hollywood Cemetery, which overlooks the James River, and you can see the the city and um, you know the modern day buildings from there. But I remember the first time that I went to see her gravestone. They're of course lying side by side, um, and on her gravestone is just simple words at peace. And at first, you know, you see that on everyone's gravestone. It seems like you know yeah. they're at peace, but it means something different. I feel like for Verena, like. I feel like the word finally should be before those words. Um, And I don't know if there's more to that two letter, two two word uh, statement than just she's, you know, she's in heaven, quote unquote. Um, Or whether that's more kind of a statement of finally she's at rest after all of these years of emotional toil and and shenanigans she went through. Yeah. 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 Legit shenanigans. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, this has been yeah. completely 100% eye-opening, so thank you so much. <laughs> good, good, good. Yes, I'm glad that you thank guys you. enjoy. I feel like I always, I, yeah, I feel like people get excited about Verena when I talk about her, which makes me excited. Again, yeah. not because I'm like fangirling on her, but just she's she's so fascinating and so many layers to unpack that I want more people to, yeah, to understand that yeah, and try to thought, peel back. Yeah. yeah. So speaking of that, you kind of alluded to um, your, I guess, your doctoral uh, project, maybe in book form. Is yeah. That, or is that something we can expect uh, soon or? Hopefully at some point. Okay, it seems okay. like every time I get back to revising it, because um, I defended the project in 2014 or 2015. Um and you know then i left the park service and moved then we had baby number one Aww. then we moved here took on a new job and we have baby number two so now it's like every time that goes down the line there's something pushing it off so every now and then i'll open it up and i'll do some revisions and go back to it um but yeah it's as i mentioned that verena is kind of the the linchpin to this story it looks at um elite confederate women in richmond and um the idea of them being social politicians um essentially Ooh helping or trying to help the city stay together socially morally politically in ways that we don't usually think women have that influence we think because they couldn't vote they couldn't hold office they're not politicians but in fact because of how they were watched how they dressed how they where they went where they you know patronized who they hung out with Um, the influence that they could have on their husbands and making certain decisions about promotions of generals or or things like that. They were very much politicians Mm -hmm, um, and and social politicians is what I refer to them as. So Verena is kind of the central story person in that niche, um, but also Mary Chestnut and then a bunch of kind of middling women as well and looking at kind of some of the social disaster that unfolds in the city and how those women tried to kind of hold hold it together when their men are preoccupied with you know battlefield stuff and official yeah. cabinet material well it sounds fascinating yeah i'm excited you. i wish you luck <laughs> i'm excited selfishly <laughs> to, to pick it up yeah <laughs> thank let you yes yeah. absolutely i know i feel people always ask me that question i'm just like oh i wish i wish i could say um but i'm also one of those people who likes to hold on to a piece of work you know ad infinitum just to make sure it's perfect before i send it off so he, he, preaching to the choir her girlfriend <laughs> yes. so, i just we gotta got you. let it go at some yeah. point let someone tear it to shreds and tell me what i need to do and then come back to it but um there's still more i want to do to kind of rework parts of it that's neat well again good luck with it and please let us know so thank that we can you. tell our listeners to go grab a copee and yes get definitely. behind us in line of course but <laughs> yeah, go grab your own copy <laughs> Uh, Dr. <laughs> Dr. Lusky, thank you so very much for joining us. Thank you, guys. This has uh, been fun. I'm glad. I'm glad. If you can think of any other topics, we'd love to have you back. Okay. Um, this, this was a blast. And to the listeners out there, thanks for joining yes, us thank on you. another journey, uh, learning about some fascinating women in the Civil War era. So we hope to catch you next time. Thanks for listening. Thanks, guys. Bye. That's What She Said was created by Amy Welsh and is hosted by Bethany Yingling and Veronica Brestensky, Esquire, produced by Matt Callery and recorded at the Gettysburg Museum of History Studios. Oh, I love to see you love her And the loving ones at home But I'll never leave our banner Till in honor I can come Tell the traitors all around that the cruel ones we know In every battle kill our soldiers By the help they give the foe Farewell mother you may never Press me to your breast again
Yeah.